Colossians chapter number 1, begin reading in verse number 25. The Apostle Paul writes, Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you to fulfill the word of God. Even the mystery which hath been hid from the ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. Now, chapter 1 of the book of Colossians has a lot of explanation, as do, if you're going to study it out, most of the first chapters of the epistles that the Apostle Paul wrote. Chapter number 1 generally has to do with an explanation of how the gospel had gotten to that group of local called out blood-bought born-again Christians other than as that church. Okay, so by the time we get down to verse number 25, he's already explained what the gospel is. So in verse number 25, when he says, whereof I am made a minister, he's saying that God called him to go and preach the gospel. Right? That was his ministry that the Lord called the Apostle Paul to. He was to be the apostle to the Gentiles. But that is not the only definition of the word ministry. Right, many minister, although many do not preach. Right, many minister, even though they do not teach. How many times in Jesus' earthly ministries did it say that women would come and minister unto Jesus and the, uh, the disciples? Right, they came and they fulfilled a need for them. That's what the word minister means. Right, they came and sought after their earthly needs while they were busy about the Father's business and concerned about other people's spiritual needs. Right? Ministering is not just getting up and sharing the Bible with somebody. Okay, There are many ways to minister to another. But God calls everyone to a ministry. Right, He has a will for you to do not only inside of the church but in your daily life to where you are ministering unto others. Does not the Bible say that we're supposed to esteem others better than ourselves? Well, if you are more concerned about the needs of others than you are your own needs, because by faith you know that God's going to meet your needs, and you're concerned with the needs of others who do not know God, then without a doubt you will be ministering unto them, seeing to their needs. Why did the Apostle Paul go through all of the bodily affliction that he had to endure? Why did he go through the, ostrac uh, the ostracizing process from the Hebrews, who once hailed him as a you know, noble man, one who was an Hebrew of the Hebrews, as he writes? Right? He was the picturesque, picture-perfect, right? couldn't find anything wrong with him, one of the best Pharisees on paper that you could ever have. And yet... Everybody in Jerusalem, everybody that had ever known him, when he proclaimed Christ, they called him a heretic, they called him crazy, and they tried to kill him. In fact, that's why he was arrested in the first place, because the Jews wanted to crucify him. But once he claimed that he was a Roman citizen and that he wanted to appeal to Caesar, there wasn't anything that they could do to him. But he went through all the social pains and hardships. A Pharisee had to be married. Couldn't be a Pharisee unless you were married. And later on, the Apostle Paul writes that he were that all men were like him. Talking about those that had lost a spouse. It is likely that the Sanhedrin council or the Pharisees or somebody granted the Apostle Paul's wife a bill of divorcement because she said he's lost his mind. I don't want to be married to him anymore. When we look at the Apostle Paul after Jesus called him, he lost everything that the world would say you need to be successful, to be stable, 
to go out and to make a difference in the world, you've got to have a good foundation. And the Hebrews tried to take it away from the Apostle Paul. But yet you still see that he says, I've been made a minister. So what's he doing? He's doing what God made him to do. Minister. He's in and out of prison because everywhere he goes, they throw him in prison for teaching and preaching about Jesus. Right? He's in and out of ridicule. He's in and out of travel. Because traveling, I mean, if you study his missionary trips, he went as far as you could go in the known world at that time. He went everywhere through Asia Minor. And he didn't do it in an air-conditioned, all-wheel drive, on paved roads, right, easy way. Most of the way he went by foot. Where he didn't go by foot, you find that he went by boat. And they weren't big old cruise ships that, you know, it just rocks back and forth a little bit and you can have yourself a merry time. No. But why did he do it? Because he wasn't concerned about his own needs. He was concerned about the needs of others. God made him a minister, so he was going to minister. And you say, well, why did he go to that group? Because they were very needy. Well, why did he have to travel all that way? Because those people knew that they needed something. It's hard to minister to someone if they don't know that they have a need. But those that know that they're in need of something, if you really are made a minister, if God puts that burden in your heart, you'll go anywhere, doesn't matter how much it costs you, doesn't matter how long it takes to get there, you're going to go because you know that there's somebody that has a need out there. But, it says, according to the dispensation, uh, made wherefore I made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you. He says, God didn't teach me everything that God taught me so that I could puff up my chest. Everything that God has worked and wrought in my life is not for my sake, it's for your sake. That's the mindset you should have as a Christian. God isn't working in me to make me better. God's working in me to fulfill somebody else's need. Jesus and all that he was, sinless perfection, wrapped in flesh. Everything that he did was not for himself. He was already God. He had it all. He made it all. But the Bible tells us, by him and through him do all things consist, that everything was made for his honor and his pleasure. He already owned it all. What was he going to gain? Nothing. But yet he went through everything that he did, not because of his need, but because of your need. God works in your life, right, just as God revealed a large portion of the New Testament through the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul didn't need it. The Apostle Paul knew it. I mean, you study the epistles, there's a lot of overlap. But he writes it some, a different way each time. Why? Because God delivered it how that church needed to hear it. It was delivered through him for their good. But what is your life? Are we not called to be vessels? What are vessels used for? They're filled up and they're poured out. God gives unto us so that we can go out and meet the needs of others. To be ministers. A vessel doesn't get to keep anything. I'm going to prove it to you. Y'all going to go, y'all going to sit down and have lunch later today? Hopefully. If not, certainly you're going to have dinner. I, need, I know you need to eat sometime. Right, but the next time y'all eat, if you get a cup out and you put some sort of beverage in that cup, if you don't drink it all after dinner's over, what are you going to do? You're going to pour it out. You're going to wash it, and then you're going to put it back on the shelf. You don't leave whatever you poured in there till the next time you come around to eat dinner. Right? A vessel is meant to be used. And what is not used is tossed out because now it's no longer meat for consumption. You leave a cup of milk out, see how long it takes before you're not going to drink it anymore. If somebody else put the cup of milk out, I don't care if the cup looks cold. I don't know how long it's been there. I can't trust it. 
We're going to pour it out. The cup doesn't get to keep what's put in it. The cup is solely the delivery mechanism for what was poured into it. Your life is a vessel. You are meant to be used of God. And then when He pours you out, we're supposed to what? Sanctify ourselves. Clean ourselves so that we're still meat for the Master's use the next time He goes to grab another cup. If you got a cup with all the crust and everything that was left over from the last drink that was put in there, you're not going to use that to serve somebody else. I'm not going to use it to serve myself. But yet we expect God to use a vessel that maybe outwardly is shiny, but on the inside, defiled. He's not going to pour Himself into that vessel till it gets sanctified, preserved for God's use. Made pure for God's use. But then, verse number 26, he says, even the mystery, talking about fulfilling the word of God, the promises of God, he says, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches, the glory of this mystery, among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery from the ages and from generations that he's talking about is, one, why God would even care about fallen man. You can't answer that one. I know that he loved us with an everlasting love. I know that he is love, but Brother Bob, I still can't figure out why God chose to love us on purpose. Other than the fact that he wanted to. But if you want to try and explain why God wanted to, you're going to have to take that one up with God. But He loved you. Why? Only God knows. But He chose to on purpose. And because He loved you, from the very moment that Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, He gave an illustration of what His plan was. It was a plan that we talked about it last week, right? Put together before the foundation of the world. Before God said, let there be light, God already had the plan on how He was going to redeem fallen man. Before there was heaven and earth and the Spirit moved upon the face of the waters, God already knew what that plan was. The mystery was that man couldn't figure out how that plan was going to work. All throughout history, recorded history, oral tradition that was handed down, Man's been trying to find a way to elevate himself to something more than just man. The Bible puts it this way, ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. They find out all these imperfections and they find out all these deficiencies of man and they try and fix them. And most of the time all they do is cause a different problem. But all of it is based around that you can make yourself something different than what you started off as. That's not true. Because you can try, and you can labor, until you're blue in the face, until your back's blown out, until you can't walk, you can't talk, can't even care for yourself. But at the end of the day, you're still a sinner. The mystery is that God made a way for man, but man couldn't figure it out. And the mystery simply is summed up in verse number 27. Right, that mystery that would make known the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles. Not just the Hebrews, but the Gentiles too. But this mystery, right, what's it come with? Riches and the glory of God. Glory is the richness of God's grace. But there's a whole lot of other benefits that you could say you're loaded down with riches after you get in. But it all starts with the mystery. You don't get access to God's glory. You don't get access to God's riches. You don't get grace and you don't get mercy outside of one thing. And that's Christ. Man could never figure out that God himself would robe himself in flesh and walk among men and die a sacrificial death to pay for their sin debt. You say, well, Brother Jordan, how do you know that man couldn't figure that out? Because God in the Old Testament prophesied that he would do it, and there were still people that didn't believe he'd do it. 
Jesus came and it caught everybody except a couple of wise men that came from the east off guard. Still took them three years to get there. I don't know how much of that was travel time. But they saw a new star and they couldn't figure out where that star came from or why it was there. So they started studying things out and then they realized that it was because of the prophecies. If they'd have known in an instant, they'd have gotten there quicker than three years. If they'd have known in an you know, if they had been waiting for him, everybody had been in Bethlehem. Waiting for the day that the Savior was going to be born. He said, But Jordan, what are you saying? I'm saying even when God, through prophecy, explains his plans, we can't figure it out. We're simple minded. His ways are above our ways. He gave them the time. He gave them everything but the, or I mean, he gave them the place. He gave them the manner. He gave them all the signs that were going to be leading up to it. The only thing he didn't give them was the time, and they still weren't ready. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying that in our day and age today, he's given us all the signs. He's given us all the requirements. He's given us everything except the day that Jesus is coming back, and there's still going to be some that aren't ready for him. How do you know that, Brother Jordan? Because everything that he said that had to come to pass in order for Christ to return has come to pass. And yet there's still people walking around just... I'm talking saved folk. It's a mystery. They can't figure it out, so they don't let it bother them. Well, no, God told you all the things that were going to happen so that you'd be ready. Even though in Bible days... The Apostle Paul knew that all the prophecies in order for Christ to return hadn't been fulfilled. But yet, how many times did he say, it's soon and very soon? John the Revelator saw everything that God had planned for him. Right? Knew. Saw with his very eyes or through the Spirit, one or the other, I don't know. Wasn't there. Don't know how he got called up to the third heaven. But I do know that he saw the events of the end times. He saw all them four horsemen. He saw all the death and destruction and everything that was going to take place. He saw everything that led up to it. And God let him pin down what he pinned down, but even he said, it's soon. You said, Brother Jordan, he's been gone for 2,000 years. Yeah, I know that. In fact, it's been longer than 2,000 years. And I know that Israel was only founded back in the 40s. But it's been 70 years. He said a generation wouldn't pass away. Well, say, I'm saying it's sooner than it's ever been. But they knew he's coming soon. Because as soon as he gets it, he's going to be here before you can even... When the father turns and says, go get my bride, or go get your bride, he's going to say, okay. He's not waiting. When's he coming? Soon. You may not live to see it. I may not live to see it, but he's coming soon. They will not tarry his coming. I hate that phrase. Because to tarry his coming means he can come. He's been given permission to come, but he's just going to wait. Nope. You know when he's going to come? When the Father says it's time to come. You know when the Father says it's going to be time to come? When it's time for him to come. God's never off on time. And the Son does not disobey the Father to wait until it pleases Him. No. He did everything to the glory, the edification, and the fulfillment of the Father's will. Don't know where all that came from. I don't know. guess I had that burr in my saddle on people saying, well, if the Lord tarries His coming, He ain't going to tarry. What he's waiting on is somebody to go out and minister to others so that all those that will be saved can be saved. And when everybody gets in, that's when he's coming. Well, verse number 27. The mystery was Christ in you. The hope of glory. You have no hope for glory. You have no hope for heaven. You have no hope for the grace of God, the mercy of God outside of Christ you know why Noah found grace in the eyes of God because one day Christ was coming Noah didn't find grace in the eyes of God because of Noah 
Noah found grace because God knew he'd use Noah to eventually bring Christ. You know why Abram found grace in the eyes of God? Because God chose him that one day Christ could come. You know why David found grace? Because one day Christ is going to sit on the throne of David. It wasn't because of what David did. Everything and every time that anybody has had grace or mercy applied to their life, it was for Christ's sake. Either because of what he did or what he was going to do. No man has ever merited the favor of God on his own. You know why Enoch walked with God in the cool of the day? For Christ's sake. You know why Enoch was called the friend of God? And why he got so close to God that one day God took him? I can't say it is 100%. But the Bible says that it's appointed unto men once to die. I only find that there's two fellas ever in the Bible that didn't die. One's Enoch. He was walking with God one day and God took him. Where'd he go? I don't know, but God took him there. And then one day Elijah and Elisha are walking down by brook. Prophet takes his coat off and he slaps the water and it parts and he, he says, if you stay with me, you'll get a double portion just like you want. Well then somehow, some way, chariot shows up and a war went afire. It takes him off somewhere. Where'd he go? I don't know. But everybody else that's ever lived died, except those two fellas. But the Bible says that everybody's got to die. Well, see, you go study the end times, there's going to be two prophets. Two fellas that are sent from somewhere after all of God's followers have been raptured out. And there's two fellas that are going to be coming and preaching and talking about Christ. And they're going to kill them, and then three days later, they're going to get back up and then go to glory. But there's only two fellas that I know of that haven't died, that according to God's commandment, that it's appointed unto men once to die, that they got to die before they can enter into eternal rest. Who's that? Enoch and Elijah. Where they been all this all these years? They've been learning whatever it is that God wants them to come back and preach about when they come as prophets. What are they going to preach? Whatever God tells them to. Why are they going to preach it? Because God told them to. But why did they go up in a whirlwind fire? Why did they get taken one day just walking with God for Christ's sake? Because they had a role to play. What are they going to be prophesying during the end times? Hey, all of this is nonsense and it's foolishness. The real king's coming. He's going to meet y'all down in the valley of Megiddo. And at Armageddon, he's going to come. He's not even going to lift a hand. He's just going to open his mouth and a sharp two-edged sword's going to come out of it. And it's going to slay all the enemies of Israel. Blood's going to come up to the horse's bridle. But he's saying, Brother Jordan, they were taken for Christ's sake. Everything that's happened. Where man has received the goodness and the riches and the grace of God has been because of Christ. So why, after we get saved, do we think we get the grace, the riches, the glory, the mercy, all the blessings of God outside of Christ? The mystery is that Christ would choose to indwell you through His Spirit, the Holy Spirit. That God, as it's written in another portion of the Bible, would take holiness, righteousness in himself and hide it in earthen treasures or earthen vessels. Put that treasure in a vase of dirt filled with dirt. That don't make sense. Why would God hide it in men? So that men could go out and minister unto others and minister to their needs. Their biggest need. Salvation. Why did Christ come as a man? Because God knows that it takes men to make an impact on other men. How many times in the Old Testament did a, the angel of the Lord, which is Jesus in the Old Testament, would come down and reveal himself to a man, but then that man would go and make an impact on others? What do you think your life is? He revealed himself to you, and he wants you to go impact others. 
He saved you because he loved you, but he left you here because you can make a difference in somebody else's life. Verse number 28, whom we preach. He's saying, we just preach Christ. Warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. You know what the Apostle Paul's ambition was? That everybody that got saved under his preaching, he would equip them, right, by faith, because he knows he can't give them what they need, but by faith he's praying that God give them what he need for their sake so that they can be perfect and presented in Christ blameless before God. I believe that that's the heart of any true missionary or any true pastor. They have been given charge over God's people, over the flock. And if they desire anything but what is absolutely perfect in God's will for the flock, they're not worth the salt that it take, you know, trade them. Not worth the powder it take to blow them away. Because any shepherd that doesn't want the best for the sheep, not a very good shepherd. I don't find that a shepherd is ever okay with a sheep having a broken leg or a sheep that gets a cut or a sheep that falls sick or falls ill. Right? Y'all wonder why some pastors, right? why most of them got high blood pressure or some of them got stress issues or everything. Why? Because they're worried about the flock. That's the ministry that God called them to. My question is, is how come that's not the case with all Christians? Because God called you to minister to somebody and their soul's just as valuable as anybody else's. Why aren't you ate up about those that God's called you to? But he says, that's his goal. Is that every man that gets saved be presented perfect in Christ. It was the Apostle Paul's will that if, even if he could become damned and go to hell, lose his salvation so that all of Israel would come to the saving knowledge of Christ. He said, that's a deal I'd make any day of the week. He wanted every man. Didn't matter where you came from. Didn't matter where you were born, what class or society that you found yourself in. You know where he got that spirit from? Christ. Because Christ was known as what? The friend of publicans and sinners. Christ was known as the one that would look on a woman who was caught in the act of adultery... And instead of bringing accusation against her, because he knows that if he had given an opinion on what should have been done to her, according to God's law, he knew that she should have been stoned. But instead of giving judgment, he just asked a question. Well, he made a statement. Those of you that are without sin, let him cast the first stone. There's only one of them that could have done that that day, and that's Jesus. And I don't find that he picked up a rock. He told the woman to go and sin no more. He didn't give what she deserved. He gave what she needed. Sometimes we're too interested in giving people what they deserve in our eyes. Ministering is not about giving what's deserved. It's about giving what's needed. I wonder if that fella... This is just Brother Jordan thinking... But we know the tale of the Good Samaritan. The account about how the one that, if the Jew in the ditch, if the roles were reversed, the Jew wouldn't have cared about the Samaritan, but the Samaritan cared about the Jewish boy. I wonder if that Jewish boy found himself in the ditch half dead because he was reaping what he sowed. I wonder if that's what he deserved. Because I know in the flesh he deserved hell. We're all sinners. We all deserved hell. I know that he deserved death. But the good Samaritan didn't care about what he deserved. He cared about what he needed. He didn't just pull him out of the ditch and take him and dump him off on somebody else. No, he needed help now. He needed help then. You find that he treated his wounds before he transported him. And then he made sure that the man could tarry there until he was, you know, fully healed. He said, treat him again if he needs it. Whatever it is, put it on my tab. I know that's what he needed, but part of me wonders, I wonder if he deserved that pit. Because it'd be a whole lot like God 
to use somebody that you didn't think he could use. Use somebody that you wouldn't help in the other situation if it were reversed. It'd be just like God to use somebody that the world would say they can never make a difference to take somebody out of what they deserve and get them to what they need, which is this, it's Christ. Why do you say, why is that, Brother Jordan? Because God uses the base things to confound the wise. God uses the ones that you think can't make a difference to make all the difference. He takes the army that there's no way that they should win, that in and of themselves that they even could win, but yet God shows up on their side, and if God be for them, who can be against them? God uses those situations where no man would be able to conquer it on his own, but yet when they give control over to God and say, it's all in his hands. I can't change this one way or the other. If he intervene, hallelujah, but if he doesn't, he's still God. And God will take that situation and he'll do something that only God can do in it. Why? Because that person that gave control over to God is going to go tell others. But I, even though they didn't deserve it, even though they couldn't earn it, that they had no merit or honor of their own to justify God moving on their behalf. God just moved anyway. And he did it through a way that you can't explain it away. That you can't understand it to prove that it was God who did it. I love it when doctors come in and say, well, I don't know what happened. Good, because that usually means God moved in. He's the great physician, but you know when the great physician does something, other doctors can't figure it out. Well, verse number 29. This is what I really wanted to teach on today. It was verse number 29. Now we finally got there. Whereunto, in other words, because I want to see all presented perfect in Christ before God, he says, I also labor. He says, God called me to minister to others, but my labor is in getting to those that he wants me to tell. Get to those that have a need, know they have a need. Put me in front of those that don't realize they have a need. Let me preach to them and show them that they do have a need. He says, my labor is all focused upon presenting others perfect in Christ. You know how the Apostle Paul could focus on the perfection of others because he had already presented himself perfect before God. He knew that he wasn't perfect, but he knew that in Christ he was. That where he would need further improvement, God would reveal it unto him. But you can't be worried about other spiritual situation if you're a mess on the inside in your own spiritual situation. You've got to be on good ground with God before you can go out and start making a difference for other people in their spiritual relationship with God. But he says, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. He says, my whole goal is the will of God. Doesn't matter what I think that means right now, whatever God's will is, that's what I'm a candidate of. I may think I know what God's going to do tomorrow, but if God does something different, Lord, that's fine with me. We plan that we're going to go into such and such a city, stay there for so long, buy, sell, get gain. But what we ought to say is, if the Lord will us, we will. Here the Apostle Paul says, I labor striving according to his working. I labor, which means I do work. But striving is the direction that you're working towards. He says, I labor all the time. I'm always putting effort in trying to do what it is that God has called me to do, be a minister. But I'm striving according to his working. Just because I think I know what labor needs to be done to help somebody, if he tells me to go a different direction, I'm okay with that. We're going to work in the direction that God points us in. And it says, which worketh in me mightily. He says, the reason that I follow the will of God in my labor is because I've seen what the will of God has done mightily in my life. You think that the Apostle Paul, well, I know this for a fact, the Apostle Paul thought that the will of God was to go out and persecute Christians, to kill them, to have bills for their murder and execution turned over to local officials. 
He thought that he was doing the will of God until what? Until he ran into the will of God on the road to Damascus. It changed him so much that he changed his name from Saul unto Paul. He said, I am a new man. No more am I Saul the Pharisee. Now I'm Paul the preacher. Who do you preach? Christ Jesus. Why? Because I know it's His will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And I know that His will was given to me. You do realize that the Apostle Paul was the one that wrote, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. How do you think he figured that out? Because he saw that once he got into Christ, he was a new creature. Old things are passed away. They's dead. He wasn't that Pharisee no more. He still had the memories. He still had the knowledge. He still had the experience. But that wasn't him. Because now he had a heart to go minister to others where before he had a heart to condemn others. He said, the will of God, I strive for it to be fulfilled. All of my labor is for the will of God to be performed. Why? Because the will of God is what made a difference in my life. And notice the description that he gives, which worketh, meaning it's still making a, a mighty difference in my life. God didn't save me and complete the project there. No, He continues to add. He continues to mature. He continues to reveal new things unto us. And notice the impact. He says, it worketh in me mightily. It's not a subtle change. It's not a weak change. It's not a working that if you have to break out the magnifying glass to really get down to see, oh yeah, there's something that's different about that. No, it's a mighty work. Why? Because it's done by the hand of God. The will of God works in people in mighty ways. That's why if you can get a drunkard to the Lord and he gets saved, he's not a drunkard no more. Why? Because the hand of God works mightily in that man's life. The old things are passed away. He's going to replace it with something new. That's why if you can get somebody, a husband and wife, that their marriage is falling apart, if you can get them both to Jesus, there's a good chance that that marriage is going to be mended. Why? Because God works mightily. If you've got a home that's in shambles, if you can get them to Jesus, it's going to be completely different afterwards. But Jordan, you got chapter and verse on that? Sure do. Go study how the church at Philippi, or Philippi got started. That Philippian jailer, he was there ready to condemn other men. But yet, after an earthquake came, he's ready to kill himself because he knew that he had failed. He wanted to give himself an honorable death rather than go through all the torture and everything else of losing all them prisoners. But yet Paul said, hey, don't do that. We're all here. What happens? Well, he gets saved. Well, how mighty of an impact can it make on the family? Well, he got saved and then he took the boys home to minister under their wounds, to treat them, get them healthy again. Then his whole family ends up getting saved. Then what happens? A church starts out of that family's home. You saying that they had an unstable home before? I don't know that they were fighting at each other and throwing pots and pans every day. But I know that if there's loss, that their house is built upon shifting sands. But afterwards, their house was built on the solid rock. How strong was that rock? It was able to launch a church out of that home. It's able for that church to grow to the point that the Apostle Paul writes a letter to that church talking about how they've grown, how spiritually they've matured. You said, but Brother Jordan, there might have only been ten people in that church. I don't care. God thought so much about them that he wrote a book of the Bible to them. Well, you're saying, Brother Jordan, the hand of God works mightily. That's the only way that it can work. Why do you think people call it the mighty hand of God? Because that's what it is. And if his hand is mighty, his work is mighty. But see, the Apostle Paul says, Wherefore I also labor striving according to his working. He says, I labor and I strive, but according to his working. The Apostle Paul had some perspective. He said, all the labor that I do, 
all the striving that I'm taking a part of, he says, it's nothing compared to the working that God's got going on. He says, it's nothing compared to what Christ just had to go through in order to offer me salvation. You realize that the Bible talks about things that Jesus does for saved people that before he went to Calvary, he didn't do? Because there weren't any saved people. What are you talking about, Brother Jordan? What well, says that he was made our high priest? You realize that every time you pray, Lord, forgive me, Jesus has to go back to that blood that he shed on Calvary and apply it to your life to forgive your sins? He didn't have to do that through all of eternity up until he went to Calvary. You realize that he's seated at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us? You realize that every second of every day throughout all time, until we get that body fashioned like His and we're made perfect in Him for all of eternity, Christ is sitting at the right hand of God praying to God the Father for what's best for you. He didn't do that before people were saved. You realize that as our high priest, the lower priest would take things that were too great for them and give them to the high priest. You realize that when he said, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you, the Lord is carrying a whole lot of burdens that don't belong to him. Do you understand that he shoulders a lot of emotional weight and emotional strain, that he's battling things in people's lives for them because they by faith believe that he would? He didn't do that before people were saved. Do you realize that either he or he's commanded some angel or somewhere else that every tear that you shed, God bottles it in glory? He didn't do that before people got saved. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I get that in our eyes. It looks like, Lord, I'm trying real hard down here. I understand that it feels like I'm about ready to give out my spiritual knees and back and hip and shoulders and everything else. They're aching, Lord. But the Apostle Paul had the perspective that all of my labor and all of my striving, he says, according to his working. If we could peel back the veil today and see how little we actually do compared to how much the Lord's doing it humble us when you realize all that the Lord is capable of doing the fact that he even considered you would even ask you to be involved in his ministry in the first place that he would think so highly of you that he would entrust what somebody else needs to your hands I'll give you a little bit of extra fuel in the gas tank because according to his working even before people got saved everything that happened happened by and through him it all existed because he exists why do you think he told Moses I am that I am because if he wasn't nothing else would be when you really get a glimpse at what God is capable of which is what whatever he wants he's working all the time but he let you get in on the work it's part of the blessing of being saved. Right? If a shovel had a mind, you think the shovel would want to be bought and hung up on the shelf in perfect condition for forever? No, that's not what the shovel was made for. That's not what the shovel wants to do. The shovel wants to dig. The shovel likes getting down in the dirt because that's what it was made to do. But what were you made to do? You were made to be used and to work for the Lord. You want a miserable Christian? Show me a Christian that wasn't, doesn't want to do what God called them to do. They're going to be miserable. You want proof? Go look at Jonah. Even after Jonah submitted to go do what God wanted him to do, he was miserable while doing it because he knew he was wrong, but yet he still had to do it. He didn't want to, but he made himself. That's a miserable person. 
You want to see somebody that's miserable? It's somebody that knows that they ought to give unto God, but they don't want to give everything, but they want all the credit for giving everything. Ananias and Sapphira sold a portion of land, gave part of the money, but told everybody that it was everything. They didn't have to give everything. But they wanted everybody else to think that they had given everything. What happened? He died on the spot. They went and took her and said, hey, that money that he gave, was that all of the money? They didn't ask for all of it. They said, was it all of the money? She said, yep, she died too. What are you saying? People that are miserable are the ones that fight against what God made them, which is ministers. Some might be shovels, some might be trials, some might be rakes, some might be backhoes. But whatever it is that God wants you to be, submit to it. If God made you a shovel, go shovel all you can. If God made you a weed eater, go knock down all the weeds that you can. If God made you a semi truck, don't go try and, you know, down to the racetrack and try to set best lap times. It's not going to happen. Right? If God made you a big rig, don't try and park in those compact car parking spots. You're going to be miserable and get tickets. What are you saying, Brother George? When God mightily worked in you, He changed your nature. And if you fight against what God turned you into, you're going to be miserable. The Apostle Paul, I find, even after being thrown in prison and beaten and they tried to kill him how many times, he submitted to being what God made him, which was a minister. And when he stands before King Agrippa, he says, I think myself happy. He says, I'm just doing what God made me to do. I'm sure that a shovel finds itself in many situations that it never thought that it was going to get itself into. Right? Especially if it belongs to Brother Ray. Brother Ray's real good at taking something and then using it to do something else that it wasn't intended to do. What's he doing? He's making it work. Right? There's a whole lot of times that it may not have been used for what you thought it was going to be used for, but it still got the job done. Saying, I don't ever hear a shovel complain. Shovel's just happy to be used. As a tool, the worst place you're going to be is on God's tool bench. You want to be in the hand of God, being used by God. If you're on the workbench, that means that He's not using you. The Apostle Paul strove according to the working of God. Saying, Lord, I know you're going to do it with me or without me. I'd just rather get in on it. I'd rather be used. I want to strive so that other people can be presented perfect in Christ Jesus before you. Lord, just use me today. Don't care how you use me. Don't care where you use me. Just use me. That's the mentality that's missing in modern day churches. There's places that people won't go. There's things they won't say. There's things that they won't do. And that's why God doesn't use them. Because biblically I find that you just submit to being used however God wants you to be used and you give it everything that you got once God reveals what He wants you to do. You labor and you strive, but you do it according to His work. Do you struggle to find good Bible-based resources to supplement your personal devotions? If so, head on over to ibcflorence.com today and click on Bookstore where we have a ton of resources. And as always, thanks for listening.